Ah, it does go. All right, well, I'd like to thank the organizers for putting together this uh, workshop and a very nice school in the previous week. I wanted to probably take a break from Wilson Loops, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, ADS black hole, ADS black string, uh, entropy story. And so this is uh, based on work done well, with one of the organizers, Leo, and uh, student, uh, and also um, with uh, my student, Junko, and uh, some work in progress. So I just want to give a little bit of introduction on this idea of um, what we can do as an application of localizations to calculate supersymmetric partition functions and then to uh, sort of use ADS-CFT to make it this sort of a precision test of holography. So just as a quick reminder for all the students in the school, when uh, we talk about supersymmetric localization, it's sort of a tool for us to compute uh, quantities in supersymmetric field theories, supersymmetric gauge theories, and typical things we might consider are like sphere partition functions, Wilson loops as you've heard about, and then if you compactify on sort of uh, sphere times S1, you can also compute uh, supersymmetric indices over here. So we had some nice lectures on localization. I won't repeat the process of localization, but just to remind you, since we're going to see some building blocks of um, basically what happens after you localize, you have a partition function that can be written as sort of a uh, classical piece, which is the integral over the localization locus times um, a one-loop determinant from the uh, quadratic fluctuations. And so it's very cute. You get uh, relatively you know, nice uh, expressions or finite integrals, matrix models out of a, a complicated field theory. And uh, so I want to use this feature to uh, connect the topologically twisted index on S2 times S1 or S2 times T2 with a black hole or black string microstate counting. This I should mention, of course, is work pioneered by Benini and Zaffaroni and many people in the audience over here. So I feel like I'm talking to the experts, actually. Um, so this is the sort of index story. And uh, to bring in ADS, CFT, and precision holography, we can do similar computations on the uh, ADS side and start comparing ADS answers with uh, field theory answers. And so standard things you can do that's been done for uh, quite a bit is, let's say you look at global ADS, and you can relate that to sort of partition functions on spheres. You can work with black holes and in ADS. And now you have a uh, time-like circle over here. So sphere times S1, or you consider a black string in ADS. And you could have something like sphere times T2, T2 being related to basically the longitudinal directions of the string. So we're going to end up focusing on black string in ADS5. So let me just sort of uh, sketch setup. So if you have a, um, medic, a black string in into the sphere space, in the ADS-CFT uh, side of things, you talk about sort of UV or IR, boundary or horizon. And on the boundary, you have asymptotically into the sphere space, ADS-5. And as you approach the horizon, you have uh, ADS-3 times S2. Now, if I think about an ADS-CFT sort of language, I take ADS5, and uh, with this topology, I have a four-dimensional boundary with topology S2 times T2. So from the UV point of view, I could talk about some sort of supersymmetric field theory on S2 times T2. On the other hand, if I focus on the near horizon ADS over here, ADS3 brings down a, a T2 on its boundary. So that means from the field theory side, you can sort of th see things both as a four-dimensional field theory on S2 times T2 or a two-dimensional field theory on T2. And, uh, of course, the relation is essentially through compactification of S2. Um, 
The highlight of the string, of course, is the torus, which should remind you of modular invariance and SL2Z transformations, and we will see that sort of uh, showing up in this game. Yes? Uh, presumably, it goes all the way up to infinity. Uh, what a nice thing about ADS is you can always have sort of nice identifications on the boundary. So it is a boundary, presumably with topology, S2 times T2. It does. Oh, the question is, what's the fall off? You mean how fast does it, does it fall off to uh, approach ADS? Um, I'm afraid I don't know that. Answer to that, um, but yeah, thanks. <laughs> so I'm going to end up talking about the index on the S2 times T2 for that sort of reason of exploring the uh, black string. But uh, more generally, this idea of uh, these ADS black objects and the uh, topologically twisted index was pioneered by uh, Benini and Zaffaroni and many friends in the audience as well. And the general setup is to imagine you take an object with some uh, horizon topology of S2, and then you can turn on some magnetic flux, so magnetic black hole, magnetic black string. And for that reason, there's sort of an S2 floating around in into the sitter space. And then when you sort of look on the field theory side of that, by having magnetic flux on S2, essentially you've turned on a, a monopole background, and you end up with sort of a background R symmetry flux on S2. It has to be done correctly to preserve supersymmetry if you're looking for supersymmetric uh, solutions here. And the end result is that you end up with a, a partial topological twist on S2 where the monopole flux basically cancels the spin connection and you end up with a system that can be computed using localization, this topologically twisted index. And so Benini, Hirschhoff, and Zaffaroni studied this topologically twisted index for S2 times S1 in regards, in relation to magnetically charged black holes in ADS4. And this has been extended to various cases, dionic black holes, hyperbolic horizons, magnetic black strings. And so I'm gonna end up uh, going to the magnetic black string case. But first, I do wanna give you a little bit of a a discussion of the uh, black hole case because it's kind of a beautiful story and it sort of sets the scene for the uh, black string. So I want to give you two examples. The first is the uh, magnetic black holes in M theory on ADS4 times S7 mod CK. This is the uh, ABJM theory. And then I also want to show you something about magnetic black holes in the massive 2A on ADS4 times S6. And after that, uh, we will move on to magnetic black strings on uh, ADS5 times S5. Good. So the black hole story, for all the students that attended the school, if you're talking about the uh, sort of three-dimensional turn Simons matter theory on S2 times S1. Alberto gave us some very nice lectures on this. The uh, building blocks of the index after you do this localization process, which I'm not going through, is that you have some set of vector multiplets, some set of chiral multiplets, and the different components are in the vector multiplets. Um, you have a prediction function that's built about an integral over the uh, Cartan torus, and uh, contributions from the uh, different chiral multiplets. And so depending on what theory you're talking about, you know, ABJM or massive 2A or something like that, you're basically putting these components together and calculating the uh, topologically twisted index. 
Now for the ABJM case, or for the uh, M theory on ADS4 times S7, you end up with this ABJM model. This is the Turn Simons matter with two uh, gauge groups at level K and level minus K with uh, four bifundamental fields, A1, A2, B1, B2. And if you just go to the previous slide and you look at all the components at index, you just put everything together, you end up with basically um, the first UN, the second UN at minus K, and the A1, A2 fields, and the B1, B2 fields, like that. And it's quite remarkable that when you actually do this, you can actually calculate, and you end up uh, trying to evaluate this topologically twisted index, this partition function, using the Jeffrey Kerwin residue. And I'll just give you a pretty picture. I hope it's a pretty picture. Um, so if you study it numerically, um, you find out that you can find a, a solution to what may be thought of as the beta assets like equations for the eigenvalues. So there's two sets of eigenvalues. There's the first UN, and they sort of go along distributed like that, and there's a the second UN kind of going on like that. I just picked certain parameters for the chemical potentials just for illustration over here. And there is, it's not completely obvious from this picture over here, because I just fixed n equals 50, but the uh, real part of the eigenvalues are here. Uh, in the way that was set up over here, are centered at pi, and they um, only go up to some values related to the minimum and maximums based on the deltas over here. They don't wrap around, but in the imaginary direction, uh, they scale with uh, n to the one half. You work on this, you uh, put it into the beta potential, you do a calculation, you find out that the topologically twisted index has a leading order term, that's n to the three halves, that's sort of what you expect from AB JM. This is black hole microstate counting, but you still expect n to the three halves behavior. I didn't actually write out this coefficient F0, but uh, that is known, that's what Alberto showed us last week. And then you find, leading, you find subleading corrections, uh, scaling as n to the one half, and then minus one half log n, and uh, so on. And uh, I have to say, we tried quite a bit to figure out what this, how can we calculate subleading corrections? This is precision holography. We want things to match, not, at the leading, not just at the leading order, but at sort of, uh, subleading terms as well. So we spent some effort trying to figure this one out. Didn't succeed. Yes? Absolutely. How do you know that? I didn't know it had to match. Well, the question is uh, the index compute things with a sign, right? Minus one to the F, and so you can get cancellation on index. Why do you expect this to maybe match black hole count, microstate counting, or uh, something like that? Um, I don't have a precise answer for that. I hope the experts might be able to uh, say something about that. But uh, it is a little bit interesting, because there are examples when you just do like super conformal index, uh, ankles for a mills, large n limit, or something like that. You got order one scaling because of the large cancellations. Uh, so somehow this topologically twisted index appears to actually capture the features that you want. And then there's some argument perhaps that the um, you know, ground states over here are all sort of like bosonic ground states or something. And so there's no minus fermions to cancel. Uh, but I don't have a precise sort of understanding of that. You could wonder, you know, even if the leading order works just by construction, if some minus one to the F cancellation might uh, give you trouble at these high, higher order terms. And so that's... To me, I don't have a full understanding of that. Good. Um, it is kind of curious that uh, we tried our effort to get the n to the one half to figure out, study it numerically, and you realize that the log n coefficient, you know, looks very like, much like minus one half, so we had a 
conjecture that in fact this is minus one half, and more, le more than just that, it appears quite universal, independent of the fugacities or the chemical potentials that you turn on. And if you're a little bit careful, uh, you can try to do a one loop quantum supergravity calculation, and uh, we're able to reproduce that from the supergravity side. If you're a little bit careful and realizing that these black holes are actually embedded in ADS5 and not just the horizon. So somehow the embedding of the black hole in ADS5 seems to be important to uh, get this coefficient to match on the uh, gravity side. So I'll give you one more example and then we'll move on. This is the uh, massive 2A case that was sort of uh, promoted by uh, uh, Guarino, Jaffreys, and Varela. And uh, here you just have a single uh, SUN gauge group at level K. The level's not balanced, it's just plus K, there's no minus K. And so you get N to the uh, 5 thirds scaling out of this model. The uh, index again has a contribution for the single SUN vector multiplets, and then from the three matter fields. Over here, so again, uh, many friends in the audience uh, worked on this calculation for the topologically twisted index. Do the calculation. I'll just give you the picture one more time. That uh, This time there's a single set of eigenvalues. This appear approximately on a straight line, but you see order, uh, high order corrections showing up when you compare the, uh, the solid line is the uh, leading order result. The uh, dots are the uh, exact numerical results. So sure enough, they were able to get the leading order term over here, um, correct analytic function of behavior, and everything like that. If you look at sub leading correct, uh, corrections, uh, you find it skips a few orders of n to the one third, and the next term, this is numerical evidence, is n to the two thirds, n to the one thirds, and log n. So there's expression in the ABJM case, you can find minus one half log n. Um, with reasonable numerical support. The question is whether we can figure out anything to do with the log scaling over here and then turn that around to an ADS type calculation. Um, and that's sort of work in progress. Good, well that's the warm up. And now I wanna move on to the black string story or the S2 times T2 index. And so let's consider one more case, uh, what's the building blocks over here? This is ADS5 CFT4 at the uh, starting point. And so we're talking about four dimensional A Mills theory on S2 times T2. In N equals one language, the uh, topologically twisted index is again broken up into uh, vector multiplet contributions and chiral multiplet contributions. Because there's a T2 Everywhere you should start thinking, modular functions, and sure enough, theta functions, the deck and theta function, things like that. Um, you have everything written quite nicely in terms of uh, functions on T2. Unfortunately, they're harder to work with in some cases as well. So these are the building blocks of the index. We want to assemble it according to N equals Fourier Mills on S2 times T2. And so let me mention the framework of this calculation, or the framework of the holography, is in ADS5, we're gonna have a magnetically charged black string in ADS5. That string over here, uh, it's easier to actually construct, or what you usually do is you go down to some U1 truncation, so U1 to cubed, sometimes called the S, TU model, which means there's three U1 fields, there's three charges. You can turn on three magnetic charges. It's a string, so the electric charges are a little bit different in uh, five dimensions. So it's basically just turn on three magnetic charges. And we can call that uh, N1, N2, N3. There's a constraint from supersymmetry, which you can realize is the sum of the charges in this convention is equal to two you end up with a near horizon solution. A near horizon solution was basically studied um, by Benini and Bobev. And uh, so 
So you know more or less all the properties you want to know at the horizon. The full meta string solution in full ADS5, well, you have differential equations. You can integrate them numerically in certain special cases. Uh, you can get some analytic solutions. There's you know, reasonably good evidence that these strings actually do exist as supergravity solutions, but the most complete information we have is basically at the horizon. So on the field theory side, because we've turned on these uh, magnetic charges for the string, we have magnetic fluxes on S2. The uh, torus itself has some outer parameter tau. And then in the field theory, you can also turn on chemical potentials. This time there's three deltas, delta one, delta two, delta three for the three U1 fields, which means the topologically twisted index in, in general will be a function of the chemical potentials. The uh, background magnetic charges implementing the twisting plus the flavor, and then the uh, torus parameter tau. So you put together the topologically twisted index, and uh, Basically, here it is with uh, one vector multiplet and three chiral multiplets in an equals one language. Again, you calculate. So you use the Jeffrey Kerwin residue and you re express this in terms of a sum over solutions to what you might call the beta onslaughts like equations of various expressions. Um, from the uh, vector into chiral multiplets. And then you have this uh, Jacobian factor over here. And the Jacobian factor is really obnoxious. That makes everything uh, quite a bit of a challenge. But you take what you get, basically, and you work with it. And uh, what you find is kind of interesting. Here's the beta assets like equations, um, where the eigenvalues, if you want to call them that, are basically these UIs and UJs. And so U1, U2, U3, up to UN. So you want to solve these expressions over here for the U's, basically. What you can find, or what Hosseini, Nedlin, and Zafiruni discovered, is if you want to avoid the complication of these uh, Jacobi thetas, what you can do is you can expand what might be called the high temperature limit. This is the limit of the shrinking, shrinking time-like circle. So this is not a thermal uh, theory, it's a supersymmetric theory, but I sometimes call it temperature just uh, by analogy. And uh, so you, in the limit of the shrinking circle, now you have modular transformations, tau goes to minus one over tau, so this tau goes to uh, I zero, can be replaced by tau goes to I infinity. You end up with simpler expressions over here. You solve it and you find out, let me just give you the pictures, the equations over here. And that the eigenvalues can be evenly, equally distributed along the time like circle. Now, u bar over here is just a constant, sort of an average value, so to speak, uh, plus this evenly spaced along the time like circle uh, related to this tau over n factor. Now, in the black hole case, in the S2 times S1 case, it was more complicated. It was those sort of lines and curves and things that I showed you. Um, there, you solve the equation. You find what you might consider sort of like a saddle point or something like that. And you say, I'm done. I'm happy. I calculate with that. That seems to be the dominant saddle. It gives me the right expressions. Well, here it's interesting. You should remind yourself that this is a torus. You should remind yourself there's SL2z going on over here. So if I had a solution this way, what happens if I do an S transformation? Tau goes to minus one over tau. Well, it flips it like that. If you actually check, this also solves the beta on such equations. This does too. So does that. So does that. It's very fun. This is doubly periodic or quasi doubly periodic. You realize if you distribute your eigenvalues sort of evenly around the two cycles of the torus to form sort of a sublattice or a smaller torus, 
it, all, it also does solve the same beta s such like equations. And in fact, if you really want a modular invariant answer, you need to keep all these solutions. So this is an example where you have not just a single saddle, but you have a, a sum of saddle points or a sum of solutions uh, that you need to take into account for your uh, modular invariance. And so you can label the solutions, if you wish, by uh, three integers, actually only two independent ones, uh, m, n, and r, m and n uh, are divisors of capital N, n is you know, the SUN theory. And roughly speaking, m is uh, how many last points you have horizontally, and n is how many last points you have vertically, r is related to a shift over here. So your original torus has modular parameter tau, and then your sublattice or your smaller torus over here can be described by modular parameter tau tilde. This is going to show up several times. Uh, m tau. So it's basically a, a fraction m over n times tau, but it can be shifted as this picture shows over here as well. Now, I have to say, we haven't proven that this is the complete set of saddles or a complete set of important saddle points. But this appears to be a minimal set that's needed to enforce uh, modular invariance. Let me just. Yes? Uh, all these are related by SL2Z, absolutely. Uh, this picture or, or this equation here? I'll give you an example. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll give you an example later on, which hopefully will make it a little bit more clear. Um, well, I'll give you an example very soon, actually. Um, but anyway, let me just give you an equation before I give you an example. The idea is that the topologically twisted index really should be thought of as sum over sectors. And each sector is labeled by these three integers, two independent parameters. And the partition function in a single sector is uh, just exactly what you might think it would be. It's just uh, the original object with uh, the UIs substituted for their saddle point expressions. You play with it a little bit, you find out there's a function of the original torus tau and a function on the uh, smaller torus tau tilde over here, uh, where this is uh, all built out of some sort of a Jacobi form, if you wish. As I say, we keep track of two modular parameters, the original torus, tau, and the sort of like an orbifold of torus, or the smaller torus, tau tilde. And you're summing over sectors, it's basically summing over different tau tildes over here. So here's the picture. Basically, well, I'll get to the picture. Um, another way to think about this is you're calculating an index on S2 times T2. If you compactify an S2, you end up with an index on T2. Trace minus one to the F on T2 is essentially calculating the elliptic genus. So you should end up with a Jacob a elliptic genus or a Jacobi form of uh, weight zero. And let me give you the, here's the picture for N equals six. There are uh, 12 sectors over here. And the uh, original solution and eigenvalues distributed along the time-like circle over here. There's another obvious one, which is the S transform of that. But in fact, there's a bunch of other solutions as well, labeled by M, N, and R, which is uh, given by these numbers over here. What I highlighted is tau tilde is uh, given by the uh, this complex structure, tau tilde, given by uh, the red and blue arrows over here. Uh, So what happens to modular uh, covariance or modular invariance? Well, if you look at uh, T transformation, tau goes to tau plus one. These are the orbits of those 12 sectors under tau goes to tau plus one. Probably the easiest one is the starting point over here when they're all distributed vertically like that. Uh, the top eigenvalue, well, over here is essentially the same as down there, but this top one over here will get transformed up here to tau plus one, so to speak. 
Um, and so everything gets translated this way, this way, this way, that way. And then the S transformation, tau goes to minus one over tau, uh, maps the uh, various sectors into each other. Again, the easiest one to see is uh, the vertical one mapping into, her, into the horizontal guys. Uh, the guys that are a little bit slanted over here are a little bit more uh, difficult to sort of work out. As you see, these sectors depend on having these two integers, m and n, that multiply to uh, capital N. And so there's, if you have SUN where n is a prime number, then there's only two ways to do it, one times n or n times one. But if you had composite numbers, which can be uh, factorized in various different ways, then you have a more complicated sort of set of, uh, set of subsectors. I'm sorry? This one? Oh, I mean, what is tau tilde? Um, so if you have a sector labeled by M and R, tau tilde, something like M tau plus R. over n, like that. I'm sorry? This is not SL2Z in what sense? Oh, no, no, this is not a transformation. No, no, no. this is just defining the tau tilde parameter. No, no, sorry, this, this, that's not the transformation. What happens? Well, you see what happens here. Now I do, tau is my torus parameter, and there's only one tau. You take tau, the tau plus one, tau tilde, in some sense goes to tau tilde plus m over n or something like that. In other words, if I'm adding one to tau over here, it's equivalent to adding m to r over here. So it takes a sector m and r into m and then r plus m. Well, then you can shift uh, the big tau by one, so you can mod that by um, n down here. All right, well, with this in mind, let me just sort of, uh, let me move on to the high temperature limit. Anytime you have these sort of uh, modular functions, the natural thing about the high temperature limit is something like a Cardi limit, is to do a, a tau goes to minus one over tau transformation. And so what happens is this is a Jacobi form of uh, some set of indices. And so the transformation of the partition function is, so the primes, all the primes are the uh, S transformed uh, version of the original guys. And then as a Jacobi form with some index M, it transforms with this exponential factor over here. And you do that, and you try to work out the expression. What uh, Hosseini, Nedlin, and Zaffaroni showed is if you assume the index is dominated by this uh, vertically distributed sector over here, which I call 1n0 over here, 
the S transform of that brings it down to the N10 vector over here with different parameters. And you study the high temperature expansion of this guy. This guy's very easy um, to look at. You end up with basically a, a C function that when extremized can be related to the central charge of the, uh, of the string. But this story cannot be complete because you have a bunch of saddles or a bunch of solutions. You should really sum over all of your solutions. If you do that, you end up with an expression that looks kind of like this. It's probably too, well, it's not that ugly, but it's got a bunch of parts to it, of course. There's a, so the chemical potentials are delta. You can choose a convention where delta one plus delta two plus delta three add up to two pi. It's nicer to scale things by two pi. So little d's are just the delta scaled by two pi. They add up to one. And you end up with the uh, contribution from the vectors, the tau dependent contribution is d one minus d. The tau tilde uh, contribution, x one minus x. The tau tilde contribution has this extra m prime involved in its expression over here. And then the second line over here is the obnoxious one that comes from the Jacobian. And there's this function alpha of the chemical potentials, which we have not been able to write down a nice expression for, so we just left it as alpha. Basically, log determinant of this uh, matrix is uh, up to some prefactors, uh, just given the function alpha of d. So if you just looked at the dominant sector, the um, one and zero sector, you transform that as the n one zero sector, which gives you a cap to n over here, this is n squared. This little thing over here is the number one, so xa equals the dA in the dominant sector. And then this term combines this with that term with an n squared minus one, n squared from here and a one from here. And, uh, well, maybe I'll write that down in the next, after this. Um, but in the dominant sector, you just get some uh, n squared minus one overall factor over here. But the real complication is to ask, I say it's the dominant sector, the N10 sector. Why do we know it's dominant? We have to actually consider that a little bit. And so what you discover is this is log of the partition function. So you're taking log or trace of the log of this determinant if the determinant, if the Jacobian itself is some order one expression or something like that, I'm looking for a one over beta term in the high temperature expansion. If the determinant is just sort of order one, you take a log of that, nothing, uh, nothing bad happens, and you just get nothing scaling as one over beta, and then you just get uh, alpha equals zero like that. The other possibility is the determinant is a little bit degenerate. The determinant goes to zero, log of zero, is kind of bad. But of course, what happens is that the determinant goes to zero, like e to the minus one over beta, something like that. Then taking a log of that gives you a coefficient of one over beta, which gives you a non-trivial alpha. In general, this determinant function alpha is piecewise linear. You just try it you know, for special cases, for n equals two. There are uh, the two one zero sector has nothing, uh, has zero over here, but the one two R sector, which is one two zero or one two one sector, there's two of them over here, um, gives you uh, a piecewise linear function kind of like that. There is a region over here where alpha is equal to zero, but then there's other places uh, where it's not. N equals three, it's a little bit more complicated. For composite, for prime n, there's a bit of a pattern to it. For composite n, it gets, uh, it's something we haven't been able to work out in a nice way, other than just looking at pictures. So 
when n is composite, it's a bit of a mess. Nevertheless, for these cases that you study, and uh, in certain regions, like if there is a region where alpha more or less doesn't contribute, then you might be able to uh, uh, show that the dominant saddle really is dominant. And so, as I said, the dominant contribution and the one that was uh, looked at previously is what we call this one n zero sector with this n squared minus one uh, prefactor pulled out. Now showing that this is the dominant uh, saddle point really is equivalent to showing this type of expression over here. This is for any m prime, m prime, r prime, which is one of these other saddles over here. You wanna show some expression like that. So if this alpha is equal to zero, then you're done, right? Because anything's bigger than equal to zero. Well, not necessarily, but I mean, if you actually work that out, uh, it's okay. But the problem is if alpha is a positive number, then you want to show that this inequality uh, it still holds. And so it appears it's not universally true in all possible cases, but at least in the physical cases where there's a nice black string in ADS dual, it appears that this is true. We have not entirely been able to prove that, but it does appear uh, to be okay. So the simple guess that there's a single dominant sector, one and zero, appears to be the correct sort of physical result. So I'm just gonna wrap up a little bit. If you do assume, this is what uh, Hosseini and Netlin and Zafiruni did. If you just focus on that single sector, you end up with a central charge function, which when extremized, gives you the central charge in terms of the magnetic charges of the string. Good, so some of the final thoughts. That actually, we started this project as sort of ADS CFT people or hol holographic people saying, can we figure out the large end limit of the index? But before we figured out the large end limit, we got sort of trapped uh, studying the modular properties of the topologically twisted index. So it would be interesting to go back to the large end limit and ask what happens. Now, of course, in this high temperature limit, you get this uh, one over beta and some central charge that scales as n squared. But if you just calculate, uh, for arbitrary beta at uh, large n, you know, what's the result? This should be some modular uh, function, presumably. Uh, basically, elliptic genus at large n, something like that. Um, in terms of these log corrections that we've been focusing, focusing on, you can also ask, you know, is there a log correction? Is there a log n correction over here? Uh, I don't have an answer for that. As I said, you would expect large n to still have modular covariance. So that's basically it. Let me just leave you with the parting thought that when we've done these sort of saddle point type calculations, whether for saddle point matrix model evaluations or for the topologically twisted index, in many cases, we just find one saddle point, we're happy. We think either that's a dominant saddle point or that everything else is sort of related by symmetry. There's not much else going on. In this T2 case, there might still be only one dominant saddle point, but if you wanted to enforce modular invariance, you really have to consider that there are multiple solutions to the saddle point equations, or multiple solutions to the beta ansatz equations. So that's my take-home message for you. Thank you.